welcome. Just a little information about our upcoming basic pattern making class and the advanced class that follows. The basic pattern making class is over four hours of instructions. It's my college class. It is college level. However, the best part about this all is you need no information. You need to know nothing before you take this class. In fact, the less you know, the better. You know, pattern making is a very misunderstood topic and we get so many variations and alterations that are really not the real basic pattern making. So we're gonna give you all of that. Like I said, it's over four hours, then the advanced, it's in June and July, the advanced is in August. There's eight classes released, one every week, but you've got the whole year to review and go over and practice and do all of those things. This is my college text, this is my college class. I'm the one teaching it, I'm the one giving the information. There's a question and answer so that if you have any questions and answers, you can come right to the source to ask me what's going on and I'm happy to help. This is what I love to do, make patterns and teach. And this is a great opportunity for me to make patterns and teach and to help you understand. I, you know that I believe that anyone who sews should know patterns. People have asked me, what, how good of a sewer do I need to be? In college, we had many people who were going to be pattern makers. They didn't, have, they didn't even know how to sew. So you need no sewing knowledge. You need no sewing experience. You don't have to be good at sewing to know patterns, but I think it helps your sewing. I think it helps to know how the pieces go together, where they came from, and all of that other information. Again, we're doing um, June and July. There'll be a, a one every week, and then the advanced will be in August. And the next little bit, we're gonna show you excerpts of the different segments, the bodice, the sleeves. We'll just show you little experts. And these, we just clip, took these out of the class clips so that you could kind of get a feel for what's going on. All right, there's over four hours of information. Hope to see you there. Happy pattern making from Silhouette Patterns. What is important to understand is that horizontal darts affect length and vertical darts affect circumference. Another myth we often hear is that darts change circumference, but not all darts do. As you can see, this dart is not affecting circumference. Once I close it up, my circumference doesn't change at all. That's a very misunderstood point and a very important point that we need to understand is that horizontal darts do not affect circumference. The dart size, a dart size is always judged by the tip. So for instance, if I took this particular dart, I'm gonna use this just for an instance, because this is a common misunderstood thing that I'm gonna use for something, but I'm gonna turn this on the back. Let's just say I drew this dart and as I drew it, I continued to go out. You see that the opening here is wider than the opening here. That opening is wider than that opening. This just might be a larger size. And as the size gets larger, the dart gets wider. So the goal here is to make sure you understand that a dart is not judged by the size of the opening, the dart is judged by the angle at the tip of the dart. And that dart will be repeated as I move it. As long as I keep the angle the same, the dart size itself will stay the same and will not change fit. Now, when we're learning all these rules, you know, in the beginning, it will probably feel like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> we'll apply them actually later. We're gonna start to see it pick up later. But I think if you can just kind of play this session over and over in your head to where you just almost can memorize it and yet you don't even necessarily know what it applies to, as we get going, I'll make sure we reference it back so that you know what it applies to. Now I will also say that when we're dealing with the classic blouse, this position has been left high and the reason why is so that when it folds back, because we generally wear that blouse open, I want the collar to be higher. So it's purposely left high, even though on some women it's maybe too high, so that the styling of the blouse when the collar is worn open will be at an appropriate place. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through other things also. There are some exceptions to the rule. So we're gonna deal with necklines and collars. And the first thing I wanna just understand is necklines 
are simply when there's been a change to the sloper. There's been a change to the base. Collars are an added piece of fabric and something's been added in, a piece of fabric's been added on, or a pattern piece has been added on. And that's really how you want to differentiate between the two. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's an important principle. So first again, we're going to play with the French curve. I can do all kinds of things with the French curve. <clears throat> I can widen it. I can lower it. I can do a V-neck. A V-neck is not a straight line. It's a, it's a gently curved line. And so depending on the look you want, you can make it a little less slanted or less, you know, more, more straighter by using that end versus an end up here. You can make it as wide as you want. Here's what I want you to consider. When I put these two into play, and close that up, I don't need to close it up, but what I want you to understand is the positioning of this back dart. Then we have the cap seam line. The cap seam line is what sews into the garment. That's where all the easing takes place, and we'll get to where we, we get that down. The distance between the cap line and the cap seam line is called the cap height. And then you've got the body of the sleeve. The center of the cap here, and perpendicular to the cap line is the grain line. That's our grain line. Sometimes when we fold it, there's an additional fold line, but we really, I rarely see this, so I, I really hate to even worry about that. In our basic sleeve, we've got a dart. Our dart's at the elbow. It's in the back of the sleeve. Generally, the back is connotated with two notches while the front is done with one notch. And it's the front of the sleeve, and the back of the sleeve. And how we know the difference if we didn't see anything but a blank sheet of paper is the dart's always in the back or the bend is always toward the back. So those are all the parts and the pieces and all that kind of stuff. Really what I want to talk about first and probably what mystifies most is the ease. And the ease in a sleeve, we're going to use our little flexible ruler. If I were to superimpose the front onto the back, what I want you to notice is that the notches align. I'm going to put a notch on the back side there just so you can see it. So the distance and the shape from the side to the first notch, the bodice and the sleeve are going to be the same. So for many years, some of you, if you've wanted more width in the bodice, you've added at the side, and that's why it messes up the relationship and that's why it doesn't work. But again, between the, the front portion, I, again, I'm going to put a notch here so you can see. Between the front, matches there. And then this portion is equal to this portion. Now remember, this is my base. In my base, and the good news is I'm going to use my little flexible ruler. And I'm going to turn it, and if you don't use the middle because it's a little more flexible, but I'm going to flex it to equal those inches. And when I do that, I'm going to use my French curve just so you can see the numbers a little bit better. It's one, two, generally about three inches. And that can be four inches. It depends on the size. So the amount that this comes in and the amount that the bodice comes in needs to be the same. So there's my one, two, three inches same. That portion again is the same. But then it splits up and the French curve pivots and goes down and there's from the notch one, two, three, four, five and a half. And my French curve turns opposite. And you can see that if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, this is where your ease comes in. I can add more ease by moving the French curve and you can see I can curve that the French curve up a little bit or I can flatten the curve and I can take away a little bit of ease. I always want ease. Standards for ease in a blouse are an inch, a half inch in the front, a half inch in the back. For jackets, it is two inches, one inch in the front and one inch in the back. And of course we know that when we sew in a sleeve, um, we want to always have the sleeve down and the less seam allowance, the better because this being convex and this being concave, the wider the seam allowance is, the harder it is to sew the two back together. So I would strongly encourage you to keep your seam allowances narrow so that it's easier to get them back, and 3 8 is a good number for that. Okay, so we see different variances in cap height, cap seam line, 
and cap line. Cap line is my circumference. Sleeve, the cap height is going to be the depth of my armhole. So I'm, if, for instance, if you measure this here and it's six inches, I'm roughly going to want a six inch cap depth of my armhole as well from the shoulder to the notch. Because when I sew these two together, I want to make sure that as I sew them together, with this sews into here, this roughly will sew into here also. If it's not, and if I fold this in half and kind of, you know, sew it together, the sleeve will pull up. And that's not what I want. I want to make sure that that sleeve goes down. And the best way for it to go down is to make sure that the sleeve cap and the depth of the armhole are the same. You don't have to really establish those relationships. I'm going to tell you to go to your patterns and pick out your armholes and pick out the sleeves that go together. But I do want you to have a basic understanding that the cap height and the sleeve depth go together. And so if I change this portion of the sleeve, I should be changing this portion of the armhole. And if I change this portion of the sleeve, I should be changing this portion of the armhole. And typically what I'll do is I'll label them as B and B and A and A. And if you think about all your fitting problems, you can really resolve them easily if you recognize that if I change A here, I need to change A here. If I change B here, I need to change B here. And if you change them the same amount, then the present relationships will maintain themselves and I'll never have to worry about will my sleeve uh, fit into my armhole. So just really fun. I, I just wanted to touch on those basics of E so that we could start to understand them and play with them. And then of course you're welcome to ask questions. And I want to make sure we understand the terminology. Um, we have a hip line, and that's the fullest part of the body. I know we learned that in skirts, but I'm just going to repeat a little bit. We have the French curve, and we know that if we place the French curve on the side, the French curve goes from the waist to the hip only. The bottom of the skirt is rectangular, and we're most likely going to throw all of that away. We have a center front seam is straight, and then, of course, we have the French curve fits at the waistline once the darts are closed up. So three things that fit are the shape of the waist, shape of the hip, and the circumference. We're going to add three more measurements to those, and I want to make sure we understand it. The first is crotch depth. Crotch depth is the distance from the waist to the crotch. The crotch is perpendicular to the hip line, and generally it's about two inches additional. Now, that just means that that's where it's done. If you go and put on a pants pattern, and the crotch to the waist is too short, if it cuts you, or too long, then that distance is wrong. And But one thing that you have to remember, and I'm going to put here, crotch depth. One thing that you have to remember is the crotch can only go up or down. So the crotch depth is either too short or too long. That's the only options that you get. Even though it says crotch depth, and I know that terminology is a little funky there, um, crotch depth can only go up or down. All right, then what we're going to do is we're going to actually extend the seam into center front. And I'm going to use this piece of paper behind it. And I'm going to kind of just add it, well, just about right there. And I'm going to tape it in place. I'm going to tape this portion in place because generally what we do now is we extend the crotch depth into center front. It's all done according to numbers, but it's usually about four to four and a half inches in the back. This is the back now. All right. Then what we do is this curved portion. I'm going to go to this for a minute. This curved portion is called crotch length. And when we take the curve of the front, the curve of the back, it is completely from the waist at center front, curved around to the back at center back. That portion is called crotch length. It's actually the depth of the body. It's the width. It's the depth of the body. It's the tummy. It's the rear end. It is the depth of the body, but it is called crotch length. 